My name is Dan Wideskopf, and uh, on X, I'm known as the ETF professor. I'm also a member of the investment committee at Title Financial Group and portfolio manager uh, of the blockchain ETF. And um, just in case anybody's wondering, we launch ETFs at Title Financial Group. And if anybody's interested in doing that, please give us a shout out. So, David, you're up, my friend. How's it going, everyone? David Jakansky here, portfolio manager within the Title Financial Group. Very excited to have Peter St. Ollinger here, uh, prof.stollinger.com. Uh, Peter, if you could just dive right in, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what brought you to this point in life and maybe jump us off on something that's top of mind in, on your head in the economy right now, and we'll dive right in with questions. Uh, sure. So I'm a former professor. Uh, before that, I was a bartender, so I peaked young. Uh, nowadays, I make daily videos on economics and freedom, so I post them over on X uh, because Elon Musk allows free speech now. Uh, and then they're also, uh, what I've got a, a sub stack. Everybody's got one nowadays and a podcast. Uh, and in terms of what's going on, you know, we've really got a lot going on in the economy right now. So we've got some stagflationary numbers a couple of weeks ago. Uh, stagflation is something that I don't think we thought would come back this quickly, right? The last time that we saw that as a country is really 1970s. We had double digit inflation, double digit unemployment. So we're starting to trend back towards that. And then, you know, probably the other big one is just the debt, right? So federal debt is completely out of control. Uh, by all accounts, you're starting to see things break in financial markets, pretty big things like, you know, the bank failures last year, uh, the Japanese yen collapsing. So this is not the Argentine peso, right? This is the freaking yen, uh, which has lost a third of its value. They're now sort of trying to panic intervene. So I think that after sort of the original sin was the spending orgy uh, that bribed the voters into accepting COVID lockdowns. And since then, really, the entire world is just being twisted into a knot trying to deal with the fallout from that. The $7 trillion that they printed, the $8 trillion in deficits that they pumped out since then. Uh, and the question always, I think, in this kind of scenario is that the Fed's tendency is to pump out easy money. And then, you know, when the inflation takes off, they stomp on the brakes. Uh, and traditionally, they keep hiking until they break something. And as soon as they break something, they turn around and start panic cutting. They do this every single time. Uh, and at this point, the question is, what's going to break? So far, the things that have broken, they just turn around and shoot a trillion dollars at everything that breaks, whether it's a bank or Japan. They just set up a bunch of swap lines on FX with uh, Japan. So it looks like we're going to be bailing them out, too. Uh, but that's really kind of the parlor game at this point is what breaks and is the Fed going to be able to bail everybody in the entire world out? Wow, what a what a rosy picture <laughs> we painted to start this show. Um, so in that stagflation thesis, this is something that we, we were kicking around um, maybe a year or two ago. But honestly, I, I question it now because a lot of the inflationary numbers we're seeing are re responsive to inflation, not so much leading indicators such as insurance or car payments or or even rent, et cetera. And, and wage growth, while declining, is still really high, higher than it was for the majority of the cycle in the QE environment. Um, so w what part of that formula do you think breaks that ends up in stagflation? Well, if you sum up inflation at this point, it is rising again, uh, starting around October. So you know, the first peak, a lot of that dripped out. Part of it was the funny way they count housing. A big part of it was just the supply chains clearing up. So a lot of the initial bursts of inflation was, you know, because you had to pay $800 to get a washing machine. Uh, and so that was always going to drip out. You also had a boost because of the Ukraine invasion, which was, you know, markets had to route around and find new suppliers. That tends to any kind of disruption in oil markets can raise prices. Uh, but that it all kind of worked out in the wash by really about middle of last year. Uh, and since then, so since October specifically, we've got now six months of reaccelerating inflation. So that's the concern. Uh, yeah, of course, you're going to have everything from insurance to everything in between going up. 
that's not a question of reaction. That's a question. That's how inflation works. Prices go up. They go up across the board. Every single one, you know, if you're the Wall Street Journal, if you're trying to explain away inflation, you'll say, ah, oh, no, 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 this was a special case. Well, OK, what we're talking about here is overall CPI. That's reaccelerating. And that's putting the Fed into a tight spot because they kind of had their gameplay worked out, which was that, uh, you know, declare victory on inflation, uh, slowly reduce rates, get back to that easy money that the Fed likes, that Wall Street likes. And so at this point, it looks like uh, that may not be able to happen. The expectations on interest rate cuts at the beginning of the year, they were seven. That's what Marcus were looking for, seven interest rate cuts this year. Uh, at this point, I think the median is about two. Personally, I don't think we're going to have any. Uh, Larry, uh, yeah, what's his name? The former guy over at Harvard. He got he got trundled out for uh, saying something about women. What the heck's his name? At any rate, there are observers who believe that the next move on the Fed is going to be uh, Larry Summers. Larry Summers thinks that the next move is actually going to be hikes, that they're not going to be able to cut anymore at this point because inflation is taking back off. Uh, so, yeah, I think... The Fed's going to have to rewrite the entire script as it goes. Yeah, in, in, in that context, I, I've heard very much around the municipal bond market. What do you think's happening in that area? Because there are far more restrictions on how they can raise capital right. with inflation going higher than, than the Fed, right? So we, I haven't heard very much about that being a problem just yet. But it probably will be. Yeah, no, I would imagine. Yeah, I don't, I don't follow municipal bonds. Um, I mean, generally, as you know, it's a safe haven. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, it's kind of a game of whack a mole. I think at this point, where it, you know things keep cropping up. What just like just last week they were talking about shadow debt, where apparently there's seven hundred billion dollars worth of uh, uh, what do they call it? Buy now, pay later. Right. Doesn't show up in the debt figures. OK, that's an enormous amount. Right. It's overwhelmingly young people who know how to use these things. I don't think I've ever bought anything by now, pay letter. I wouldn't know how to. Uh, so you've uh, it's you've just got all these little gremlins in there. You know, one of my favorite sort of reminders is that when you look back to the 2008 crisis. So what set it all right? It was uh, CDOs and MBSs. Right. And when those things went off. The week that it crashed, right, right around Lehman, you had all these little explainers in the Wall Street Journal, like, what is a collateralized debt obligation? Because nobody knew what they were. People on Wall Street didn't know what these things were, right? If you watch it, you know, you watch the movie, The Big Short, where he's sitting there trying to price these things out. They're all having a good old time. They're like, I don't know, give them a nickel, give them a quarter. Nobody knew what this crap was. And this stuff tanked the entire world, all right? That's what concerns me, is that when we talk about the Fed hiking till it breaks, we focus on these big markets that we can see, things like treasury yields, right? But if we look back through history, it's crap that nobody ever heard of, right? So my concern is that when things do break, we're going to get a whole bunch of explainers in the Wall Street Journal teaching everybody on Wall Street what the thing is that just took the entire world economy down and that we have we have no idea. I mean, there were like half a dozen people who knew what CDOs were before they broke the world. That's what concerns me. So, I mean, based on Powell's recent speech he gave, or markets walked away thinking there was very, very little chance of any rate hikes um, at any point in the future. And, and actually, the one of the strangest things about it is that they are now obviously only predicting, I think, about one and a half rate cuts this year, but something yeah. as minimal as about 125 basis points in perpetuity. So, like, we as a collective market are trying to figure out this new R star point of uh, a short term rate that's not going to have a, an effect on inflation in either direction. As if that number is a constant, it probably isn't a constant, right? Um, but where do you see this inflation coming from? Are you in the camp that rates are actually uh, heating up markets? Like I know some people are talking about that, but. You know, energy prices are low. Rental prices seem to be rolling over again. A lot of that inflation stuff was responsive. Like, it, it, it's unlikely that car prices are going to continue to go off from here, et cetera. Like, what is that next leg if it's not a geopolitical conflict and it's commodities that cause it, right? If something like that happens, I understand. But uh, even commercial real estate seems like it's siloed enough 
in in the marketplace and not a big enough portion of the bank's balance sheet that it's really going to blow everything up. So where is that next? I like. I mean, I guess I'm asking you to find a needle in a haystack, but where is that yeah. needle? So, yeah, I think you're right that um, cost push is going to be a relatively small part of it. You have ongoing relative you know, uh, regulatory pushes, things like uh, rules on produce and agricultural products. Of course, there's a never-ending river of regulations that push up prices across the board. But uh, compared to historical trends, I don't think that's going to be a big deal. I think that really what's what's driving inflation at this point is simply the money supply. There is a well-known lag on that, right? The vast majority of money that's printed up by the Federal Reserve is saved. Any given moment, 90% uh, plus of money in existence is saved. It's in long-term savings. And then that stuff drips out for various reasons, right? So if you look at, for example, the rundown in savings uh, since COVID, right? During COVID, there was this massive buildup of savings, just trillions of dollars across all income levels. That's draining out. I think that really what we're seeing at this point is the Fed, to a certain degree, reduced the money supply. I think we actually had absolute shrinkage in the money supply. It's the first time since the 1930s. Uh, but nonetheless, when you print up that much money, right, I think the the net number, the Fed had pushed M2 up to about, or plus 7 trillion, so like 20, I think it was 21 trillion. And then it came back down 1 trillion, right? But the other six, right, if you print up $6 trillion, like strictly speaking, all right, before they printed the 6 trillion, the money supply was around 15. Right. So why didn't they print six and inflation go up 40 percent? Well, the reason is that the vast majority of it is saved. Right. It's it, it's salted away. If I print money and I give it to you and then you bury it in the ground, you have effectively unprinted it temporarily. Right. It's not circulating. It's not driving up prices. OK, so I think that what we're seeing here at this point is that essentially that 40 percent growth in the money supply, if they had neutralized that, right, if they had brought the money supply down fast enough, then they could have stopped that from hitting uh, circulation, from hitting prices. They haven't, right? At this point, they're they're slowing down uh, on the taper. They just announced that they're reducing the taper by 420 million, which means that effectively, you know, previously uh, they were soaking up 420 billion dollars and money sloshing around. They're going to stop doing that, right? Uh, that drives up inflation. You've also seen. That money is relatively easy, actually, on Wall Street. Money's still flowing, uh, you know, probably lent out at the zero interest rates during the pandemic and to a certain degree before then. So Wall Street is flushing money. The money supply is not shrinking enough to cancel out the 40% increase that they plowed through post-COVID. So I think that's what we're seeing here. Uh, If they kept hiking rates... To a certain degree, that would rein it in. Uh, if they sold off their balance sheet, I think that that would have been a lot better, uh, which they just reduced. So they, they've essentially taken out of play their most direct way to reduce inflation uh, and soak up some of the money they printed. We, we, were talk- we were talking a lot about the U.S. here, but right. this is a global problem, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you were talking earlier uh, about Japan, you know, how can central banks coordinate, if they can at all, to solve the problem? Which problem? The inflation problem. And it's different for each? Oh, for each different. Yeah, they just hike rates. I mean, <laughs> they just hike rates. It is, it's not rocket science. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the problem is that all governments of the world are addicted to easy money. Uh, inflation, you know... If you pump out inflation, if you have near zero interest rates, then you get this tissue fire in the economy, right? It burns bright, it burns short. Uh, that is going to be excellent for the upcoming election, right? It drives up, drives up job growth, drives up incomes, uh, and the inflation tends to not come until later, right? So it, it's like a drug, right? Uh, you get the you get the party tonight, you get the hangover tomorrow morning, uh, and you know governments have the self control of three year olds, and so. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess governments could coordinate, but, you know, they're not going to have any more self-control if they get together and party together. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, what you need is a hard money ethos. There was a time when central bankers had sort of a uh, professional culture uh, where they had a lot of focus on hard money. 
that started to erode, of course, after FDR broke the gold standard. And then it was, I think, pretty much put to death uh, by Richard Nixon. This point, you know, you, you still have some guys at the Bank of Japan who are relatively hard money. Uh, it's a relatively hawkish monetary uh, culture. Um, you know, the Japanese government has been in such deep trouble that they haven't actually conducted a hard money um, policy, but culturally they are. Uh, but across the major central banks of the world at this point, you really don't have many hard money guys left, uh, which is part of the reason I think that we're going to get inflation for a long time to come. Of course, the other thing driving the inflation is that at this point, the debts of major countries, right, whether it's the US, Japan, Europe, Canada, the debt is so enormous that functionally governments need inflation because inflation causes the de debt to melt away, right? So if you take the US, for example, we have 35 trillion in debt. If you get 10% inflation, that effectively, that reduces the debt by 10%, right? You may as well have paid back three and a half trillion, right? I mean, it's, it, it's amazing how that works, right? You know, when people talk about Weimar Germany, well, okay, but the national debt went away pretty darn fast, you know, converted into the cost of a newspaper or something. Uh, so it becomes tempting for governments, however tempted they normally are to pump inflation because of that short-term economic benefits so you can win the next election. At this point, they've got this additional incentive now of melting away uh, the national debt. So a couple things that I I would I found surprising in your response there that I would potentially disagree with is I feel like in 2020 the Fed rushing to the market was felt like a way to save all and it feels okay, to like save. to save all to like really save all participants in this market and everyone thought that this was something that was actually helping the masses and I I now think that like the country and views the Fed almost in a more like populistic way where it's like that actually doesn't help the average citizen and that's oh it doesn't the yeah of no, the of course American now right. so I think that kind of uh fuel added to uh the balance sheet I think would actually be met with a lot of opposition um and and then also if if interest rates are that high just with so much of the debt being on the government's balance sheet more so than the corporate balance sheet, you're really just going to jam up the budget of the government, which is one of the biggest employers, right? So I don't see how that wouldn't, you know, cause a huge spiral down because they're bigger. Big, one of the biggest employers in our nation is the government, right? And so like by causing interest rates to go so high, that would eat away at so much of the actual budget to just pay off debt that wouldn't that in fact in itself decrease uh, growth completely. Like I, I feel like I'd have a little bit of a negative effect there. Well, you want to ask? Um, okay, so the government consumes many, many workers. Yes, and what does it do with them? It doesn't actually create wealth, right? So we would actually be much better off if the government would not employ so many people. If it would say have lower taxes and employ fewer people, and then those people could go get jobs that actually do something useful. So I, I, for me, it's an enormous plus if the government has a harder time borrowing money or has to contract because that releases all those resources. It releases the workers, the steel, the construction workers, all the rest of it. It releases that back to the private sector. So to give you an example, remember the, um, God, there was that bill that was going to rebuild the racist overpasses, right? The, uh, the infrastructure bill a couple of years ago. And they were literally going to tear down overpasses. They were going to rebuild them because of politics. Perfectly functioning overpasses. Now, at that time, we had this enormous uh, supply chain jam, and the occupancy rate for warehouses in Los Angeles was like 98, 99%, right? It was essentially impossible to find somewhere to park your stuff in Los Angeles. So, all these importers were having trouble because you bring in a container full of washing machines, where are you going to put it? You know, in warehouses. So they were literally dropping containers in the middle of the street in residential neighborhoods, which is illegal, right? So anyway, that was our scenario. So, and then, so the government runs in with this trillion dollar bill that they're going to go knock down overpasses and rebuild them. So they're going to use construction workers, they're going to use steel, they're going to use all these things that are already in massively short supply, right? That was during COVID. So a lot of people didn't want to work, right? So they're going to hog all those resources so that the warehouses in LA 
can't bring stuff in, right? That is a concrete example of the problem here. Yes, the government employs a massive number of people. Spend set, or Biden wants to spend $7.3 trillion. Right? That's a third of everything we produce. They, they waste that. They overwhelmingly squander it. So, yeah, I'd be absolutely uh, thrilled if they, um, if they reduce that. Now, the other point you raised is what happened during COVID. And so the Fed pumped all this money out. Now, there was another way that they pumped money out, which was stimulus checks. That was far more populist, right? The stimulus checks went to everybody, rich, poor. Thing is, the Fed does not issue money the way a stimulus check does, right? It, it, it doesn't have a helicopter where it kind of sprinkles money over the city. The Fed introduces money via asset markets, right? And so the way that the Fed $7 trillion gets in there is via the asset markets. It pumps up the prices for all these other things, or it goes out to subsidize loans. Loans overwhelmingly go to rich people and companies. So functionally, the way that the Fed always stimulates the economy, which you don't want it to do because that causes inflation, but just looking at the stimulus itself, that always goes to the rich people. So it would have been far more populist if they had not gotten the Fed involved, just keep rates wherever they were, uh, and instead they had put that in stimulus checks. But of course, if they had not done the lockdowns, then they wouldn't have needed the stimulus checks. It was a flu. It was a bad flu. People die of the flu all the time. I think something like 60,000 a year die of the flu. The flu is a horrible disease. We don't shut down the economy every year for it. So, right. In terms of what would have been best for the people, number one, don't shut down the freaking economy. Lay 25 million people off. <laughs> so that would be a really good idea. If you can't control yourself, the number two might be issue stimulus checks to everybody rich and poor alike. And number three is have the Fed shoot a fire hose of $7 trillion at rich people and then hope that it dribbles down. Of course, it dribbles down in inflation before it dribbles down in income, which is exactly what we saw in wages. Yeah, so so forgive me, Peter, but you sound like you're um, making a straw on the argument for cryptocurrency. You know, or a what? What are, what are people for cryptocurrency? It sounds like you're you're... Making a struggle or, or Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, um, and and you know, are are you basically making the case for gold, gold miners, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency? Uh, yeah. So very specifically, uh, hard money, I think, solves a lot of these problems. I think, to a first estimation, hard money would shrink the government by about half. That means you'd have a lot less regulators, a lot less. Anyway, you'd have, <laughs> you'd, have, you'd have less wars. You'd have a lot less problems. So I'm a huge fan of hard money. The question is then, what kind of hard money would that be? And I think the two most obvious candidates are gold and Bitcoin. Uh, historically, whenever governments screw up paper money, of course, gold is the savior. It's the angel that rides in and saves the day. Uh, I think that Bitcoin at this point is pretty fascinating. Uh, it, of course, doesn't have the market familiarity. Uh, it doesn't have the installed base. It also doesn't have the history, right? So remember, gold was the money uh, up until, what, 1973. So that's actually living memory. Like, there are literally bankers alive today, people like Warren Buffett, who remember an age when gold was the money. Uh, so, you know, if this theoretical paper money collapse happens in the next 10 years or something, I think we will certainly go to gold. If it doesn't happen for 30 years, then there's a good chance we go to Bitcoin. At that point, a lot more people will understand it. Of course, Bitcoin is designed to behave just like gold, right? You've got the miners. You've got a very nice stock-to-flow ratio. I think Bitcoin at this point is 0.75% stock-to-flow, somewhere around there. Uh, so it, it functions very much like gold. And of course, the benefit that Bitcoin has, well, well the problem Bitcoin has is that in theory, it could have some technical flaw. Every year that goes by, that probability uh, goes down. And then the other risk, of course, is that governments might try to ban it. And then what would that do to demand? Keep in mind, you know, like if the U.S. bans it, then other countries still use it. So it doesn't necessarily kill it, um, but it would definitely have an impact on the price <laughs> for a while. So those are the downsides of Bitcoin. The upside of Bitcoin, of course, is that it cannot be seized. Right. So the problem with running a currency on gold is that you have to tell the government where it's located. Okay, like if I have a gold-backed currency, I tell everybody, I got a bunch of gold. I can't tell you guys where it is. But anyway, buy my gold paper and it's it's fully backed, right? Nobody's going to buy it. 
So you've got to actually like show them where the gold is, right? You have to have an auditor and you have to have a location. Maybe you have to have a, a camera showing them. You have to mm -hmm. open up the gold every so often to make sure it's not nickel on the inside, right? That means that necessarily you have to centralize the gold because you have to guard it, right? Gold's valuable. You have to put walls around it and alligators with lasers on their heads, sharks with lasers on their heads. And that means that government is going to know where it is, right? If government knows where it is, government is going to come and share their opinions about what they think you should do with that gold. And of course, if gold is the basis of your monetary system, they have a lot of ideas what you should Maybe. do for your gold. So that's exactly what happened in, you know, with FDR. He he literally seized the gold. He forced everybody to sell it. If he didn't sell it, then they would throw you in jail. Uh, and this is a fatal flaw, in my opinion, of gold. This is why we have these long monetary cycles where... Uh, you know, paper money screws it up. You get hyperinflation. People say never again will we trust paper money. They go back to gold. Gold does great for whatever, 30, 50 years. And then people forget about the bad times. Governments come in, they take the gold. The people don't go out in the street and get upset about it because they don't remember how bad it used to be. Uh, and so we go through this cycle over and over. So that's part of the reason I'm excited about Bitcoin is that I think fundamentally the fact that you cannot seize Bitcoin, right, that you can verify the Bitcoin, okay, you can see that the person has it, yet you cannot go and grab it for yourself. This is unique. This is a very big deal. Uh, so I think if Bitcoin has the potential to finally break through those cycles of paper money, uh, but of course, you know, that's going to take a while, right? The median Bitcoiner at this point is, I don't know, 28 years old or something. Uh, they don't have many assets. They're not at an age where they have many assets yet. Uh Senior bankers are not familiar with Bitcoin. Uh, so I think for sure it's going to take a couple decades. You can't seize Bitcoin, but you can track the person who sent it, right? Like, so Correct. That, Absolutely. And, and we've also seen like in funding of, of some wars in the past couple of years that like people actually choose to no longer recommend sending funding in, in cryptocurrency because it was actually... Yeah more easily tracked than if they just <laughs> use dollars or hard assets such as yeah. gold. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I, I, I've been a multi-year holder of Bitcoin, um, but I also think that, like, I worry that there needs to also be a catalyst beyond just price because right now it's just, like, at what pace and how quick will RAs and retail adopts the Bitcoin ETF versus how much are they mining every single day? And that seems to be the most important thing. And so um, can we keep our attention as a collective investment group on something if you don't have price action? And you know, 35% of uh, volume is retail right now. And they uh, we'll, we'll see if, if there's like a muted. It's, it's ironic that if you actually see a drop in volatility, that might actually be uh, a deterrent sure. to future price because it's just mm -hmm. not fun enough, right? And the other side of it is, is there too much greed in small gains in Bitcoin that's that been taken and just trying to play the lottery tickets on the other coins down the spectrum? Like how much excess return in Bitcoin is just uh, gassed out on the other side, rolling down to some of the, if you, for lack of a better phrase, smaller cap coins, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I mean, the the speculate. So in the case of both Bitcoin and gold, speculation is going to be overwhelming because the main value proposition of both Bitcoin and gold is the prospect that it replaces paper money. Uh, if you go through the comparable metals to gold, uh, less than 10 percent of the value of gold is intrinsic. 90 percent plus is a speculative gamble that gold is eventually going to be money again, as it has many times in the past. Gold is absolutely a speculative asset. Uh, Bitcoin is more so a speculative asset. Now, if you take that, right, so there's about 120 bill, or trillion, about 120 trillion of money in the world, paper money. And gold's market cap is something like 13, 14 trillion at the moment. So implicitly, what the market's saying is that there is a 12% chance, roughly, time value money, there's roughly a 12% chance that gold is going to be the money. It's going to replace paper money. On the other hand, if you take Bitcoin, so Bitcoin is something like a tenth of that. Okay, so the market is saying there's about a 1% chance that Bitcoin is going to be the money. Uh, both of them fluctuate a ton, right? If you just take gold, so for example, uh, in the past couple of decades, there have been periods where gold has doubled or dropped in half in a matter of two, maybe two and a half years, right? That's happened several times. 
Now, if you didn't know the history of gold, you would look at that and you would say, there is no way that can be a currency. You can't have a currency that doubles every year and collapses by 40%. You're off your rocker. Okay. So what's happening here? Well, if something is not the um, dominant money, then it's going to be a lot more speculative, right? If gold is a speculative bet on the odds that gold will replace paper money, then yes, it'll be all over the place. But we know from history that once gold does become money, right, if that gold demand is sort of that ballast where it's holding on to it as reserves as opposed to speculating on it, then the volatility on gold drops dramatically. In fact, it drops much more than it does for the U.S. dollar, right? So it's the same story in Bitcoin, right? So currently, if gold is 90% speculation, Bitcoin is <laughs> all speculation that it's going to be a currency because, okay, you know, you, you can't make jewelry with it, right? You cannot do anything else with it. It has no, as Peter Schiff likes to say, it has no intrinsic value. Uh, the value of Bitcoin is that monetary value, right? Which is overwhelmingly the same for gold. But the moral of the story is that Bitcoin is all over the place. It's even more volatile than gold. And just like gold, if it were to become the dominant money, then it would be perfectly stable because it would have that base demand. So in either case, I agree with you absolutely. There's tons of factors in the near term. You got retail in, you got regulatory this, you got Elizabeth Warren saying the other thing. Who knows in the in the short run? I have absolutely will Bitcoin be lower in five years? I haven't the slightest clue. I think it'll probably be higher, but who knows? But the question for me is always what is the long term prospect, right? What is the story here? What's the fundamental value coming for Bitcoin? And similarly, what is it for gold? As an investor, therefore, if you think there's more than a 12% chance that fiat money will die and be replaced by gold, then you should buy more gold. If you think there's more than a 1% chance that paper money dies and will be replaced by Bitcoin, then you should buy Bitcoin. If you don't believe either of those two theses, then it's a casino. You know, it's it's historically it goes up more than it goes down. So, you know, God will pr probably protect the innocent. Go ahead, <laughs> go play. Um, but fundamentally, I think that's the value proposition on both Bitcoin and gold. And, and how do you envision real estate, both in the context of how it is today, but also the opportunity set for real estate to be on chain, sold that way as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think tokenization of assets is fantastic. Um, you know, I think it has the potential to decentralize a lot of markets that, because of their current centralization, tend to be uh, in bed with government. Uh, so things like stock markets. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of tokenization. Real estate is obviously one of the great applications along with stock markets. Uh, I mean, in terms of real estate as an investment, I, I think it's also quite attractive at the moment. It's a reasonably good inflation hedge. If you go back through history, uh, residential houses in the U.S., for example, almost perfectly keep up with inflation. Uh, and of course, you can live in it. And of course, you also get subsidized uh, mortgages from the Fed. Maybe not at the moment, but usually. Uh, and, you know, you can leverage that through cheap bank loans. So broadly speaking, I am a huge fan uh, of real estate. And, and how big, everybody talks about um, tokenization in the trillions, right? Do you, what, what numbers are you looking at in the context of tokenization that are believable? I mean, I've seen 16 trillion of value is going to be on chain. I've seen even bigger numbers than that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, global wealth is somewhere in the range of 350, 400 trillion. Um, what, what percent of that can be tokenized? Well, uh, apparently from Bitcoin, we know that all the money can be tokenized. <laughs> uh, so that's so that's a buck 20 right there. Uh, I mean, the rest of it, you know, if the question is a more efficient way to represent uh, titles, uh, I mean, essentially all of it uh, could be. To sort of get perspective, so in the Middle Ages, uh, during feudal times, that was really the golden age of property rights, right? And you could take like a tree, for example, and you could have one guy who owns the tree. So like he has the right to chop it down, for example. Uh, you would have somebody else who owns the fruit. And you would have somebody else who owns the fallen leaves, which had value, right? You could rake those up and then you could sell those as kindling. 
uh, yet somebody else, perhaps, who owned the fallen branches, which is a different asset, okay? And, you know, they were very poor back then, so a tree was a sufficiently valuable asset that it was worth sitting there and carving up what all these contracts were. Um, so, I mean, the moral of the story is that, like, if you look at the things around you, there's a lot of stuff that is not monetized, that does not have titles to it. And the reason it doesn't is because the thing is not worth enough compared to the costs of tokenizing it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but when those costs are high enough, so for example, a song, okay? If you ever tried licensing a song, it's a nightmare because you got like, you got like at least three different entities. You got the guy who composed the freaking song. You're like, you gotta be kidding me, man. Like, you know, I just want to rent the song. I don't, I don't care who the composer was. Uh, but you got all these characters. And so I think the point here is that the promise of tokenization is to get the prices so low that you would be able to tokenize not just everything on Earth, so call it whatever, 350, 450 trillion. Uh, I, I mean, things that we've never even thought of. Um, and that I don't know, the right to play music loudly at night next door to me. Uh, uh, to, who knows? Uh, when you put all those together, I, I I don't know, quadrillions of value, a very large number. Hey, eh? if I could actually think out what the applications were, then I would be an entrepreneur instead of an economist. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a very, very large number, which you could tokenize. Now, the people creating the tokens may not capture much of that value. OK, that's that that that's kind of the point. Like if the tokens cost almost nothing, it's exciting in that you can tokenize all the things. But it also implies that there's not going to be a ton of profit. The guys doing the tokenization. That'll all be competed out. The the biggest number, and I'll let, let you go, David. Um, biggest number I've heard is six hundred and forty-seven trillion dollars. Just to have some. <laughs> I trumped them. <laughs> go ahead, David. Yeah, can you talk me through how like the stagflation thesis works with the real estate side of it? Just because. I think one of the biggest head scratchers is, especially on coastal cities, you're at a point where the cost to own is almost twice as high, at least 80% increase to the cost to rent. And so if interest yeah. rates are going to get even higher, that number gets even further out of whack and whack and stagflation it is stagflation because of a lack of wage growth, right? So if the cost to own versus the cost to rent just continues to diverge even further with higher interest rates and wages come down, like you almost we just come down with some issues of in, in employment, which means there's people ha are forced to move and, and have to sell at inopportunistic times, right? And not just like uh, to cash in their nest egg when they feel it's most appropriate. Um, isn't that a whole, isn't that uh, an environment that would actually be bad for real estate uh, or at least specifically residential real estate, like the one asset class that's had no volatility at all in the last like five years, really? slowly going on an upward march to a yeah, no, So Yeah. Yeah. So if you break down stagflation, right, you got two things happening there in terms of real estate prices. So the inflation part is the easier one, and they're just everything goes up, including houses. Uh, and then the other part of it is the stagnant part, and their incomes are coming down. And there is a certain relationship, or uh, not a certain, there is a weak relationship between uh, incomes and house prices uh, it, you know, if you look at, for example, Canada, I think is more than two X, uh, American ratios and Canada is a fairly similar economy. Uh, we were living in Taiwan years ago and it's, uh, like, if you look at the real estate prices, which are pretty close to American levels, the, like, the average Taiwanese income, which is, I don't know, a third of American, it might be lower. Uh, you really have an astounding range of ratios between incomes and, um, housing prices. And, you know, the way that that translates into real life is that, sure, most people can't afford uh, to buy. And so what ends up happening is that other rich people buy the houses, own the houses, gain the capital appreciation, and then poor people inhabit or relatively poor people inhabit it uh, because otherwise the asset is just sitting there empty. So, I mean, we were living in Taiwan as renters and it was very, very, ch I mean, it was ridiculous. It was like $400 for a gorgeous apartment in a large city. Uh, but the reason is because other rich people could buy this million dollar asset and then rent it to us for almost nothing because otherwise it's just sitting there empty. So the, the point being that like, there's no natural break, like, you know, there's no God given reason why the incomes have to match up with the asset values. 
uh, the that, assets. That and... million dollar asset that you were paying four dollars yeah. a month for is a negative yep. cash flow asset. Or if it's not a negative cash flow asset, at least it has a negative opportunity cost to money markets, right? Yeah. Well, they, uh, well, they were they were speculating that it would keep going up, which it did. So, so they will pay into an asset that it, that's income is not meeting its liabilities in a year to year basis as that it, yep. for that inflationary hedge is what you're saying. Um, gosh, or the capital gains, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, everybody does that in the U.S. too. You know, people say, oh, why am I going to pay 2000 rent when I can pay 2000 for a mortgage? And well, what's the difference between the two is capital appreciation. So, yes, oh. the main reason for investing in real estate is capital appreciation. Prime, prime A real estate in coastal cities prior to 2020, I would argue, traded at like a zero yield, right? Like there, it wasn't a negative Good. yield. It was yeah. kind of like a zero yield. Now it's right. a negative yield, right? Now... Everyone talks about like, oh, we're no longer in a negative yielding environment. I was like, have you seen a two bedroom condo in any coastal city in America? It's a negative yielding asset, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. So I just it, it kind of breaks my brain thinking about that ratio going even higher. But you, you're probably correct. So now, yeah. yeah, I mean, places like Canada are just striking, and uh, Britain. And, and in fact, the U.S. is one of the cheapest real estate markets uh, among major markets. You would not expect it to be this cheap. Australia, Canada, UK are just off the charts in terms of the ratio between incomes and uh, house prices. But, but to your your point earlier, though, it's like mortgages are still available, right? Yeah. And and rates may be higher than when we were at two percent or three percent, but they're affordable relative to where they've been in different cycles. Yeah, I mean, not, no, because the, the right. income to house costs is 10 times as high. It used to be that a house was a mul couple multiples of your annual income, and now it's like 15 times. So it doesn't matter the rates are lower, Dan, that it's still a broken equation where it's too much of your disposable income. Sorry, Peter, the question. Yeah, no, no, no. He's challenged in the No, so. well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So, like, if you look at compared to pre pandemic, so houses went up about 40%, I think, from memory, 30% or so. Uh, and then, of course, mortgage rates, what, two, went up, <laughs> what, 150%. Yeah. Uh, all the rest of it went up too, right? The insurance, the uh, the property tax, right, which is connected to the, to, the, to the price and so on. And so you put all this together and housing costs are 2x what they were before the pandemic. Uh, that is what it's just about 3,000 a month. The median household income in the U.S. is 6,000, right? So that's for the median house, it's 50%. Traditionally, 30% was the benchmark for prudent uh <laughs> and that's the median at 50 percent. so i mean there are definitely people who can buy without a doubt um, the housing market is a lot smaller than it used to be but it's not completely frozen uh but on the other hand i think for most people given how fast those those costs went up i think that a lot of people uh even if it makes sense on paper like from an accounting basis for them to buy they're just reluctant to because mentally they feel like that's way too expensive it costs too much. Um, after a couple of years, the the memories start to fade and then maybe they'll start buying again. But at the moment, I think that people absolutely feel like housing is really expensive. It, it is expensive. Um, but it was in periods in the 70s, a lot higher, meaning yeah, right. rates were a lot higher. I mean, our memory is very short and we've been very yes. spoiled. And real estate was much less valuable back then. I get it, right? Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, you can look back and see that people were able to afford a 14% mortgage yeah. because real estate went higher. I mean, that, that's that was exactly the bet. It. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's always the bet when you get um, rates go up that high is that people, you know, start to get in their mind. I mean, also remember the 70s, you had generalized inflation anyway. Uh, and so, you know, people were sort of hardwired to think that everything was going to go up. And of course, if you're getting a subsized mortgage, I mean, it was it was 14 percent mortgage. But of course, inflation was like 20 percent. And so I don't have the numbers handy how they track. But uh, it, it, it was probably essentially free money, even at a 14 percent mortgage. Uh, and, you know, I think at the moment, because that's one of the big questions, right, is whether housing is going to fall. And, you know, of course, the trick there is that housing did go up a bunch, went up, say, 30 percent. Uh, since pre-pandemic, but of course, inflation also went up a bunch. So there's a raging debate on exactly how much it went up. Uh, official statistics say whatever, 22% or something. 
uh, fast food menus, which the Big Mac index, uh, anybody who's in finance knows that that is a uh, benchmark and it's a heck of a lot more honest benchmark, I think, than government statisticians. Uh, and anyway, you know, you look at fast food menus and they're up like 55 percent. Yeah, so depending on how you count inflation, housing is either up something like 6% in real terms, which is actually not very much for four and a half years, uh, or it's actually down 20% if you believe the big backs. I, I honestly, maybe I'm just missing it, but Dan, I still don't fully understand how you can relate to two interest rate periods when you know a Canadian citizen on average has to pay 80% of their income to their house, even if interest rates are not 14%. I'm making up that number. I don't know. It's a very high number. Okay. Hey, man, you're going to be going. I was like... No, 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 no. I apologize. It's a very, very high number. What I would also say is if you feel confident about the real estate market, but market, go to Zillow and look at Texas or Florida. doesn't really matter where. it. You will see more red dots than you've seen on a Zillow map since 2019. Um, just the amount of available homes in Florida and Texas, some of the fastest growing real estate spots in the entire country has absolutely surged. And it's very much location based because it's very much based on migration and ability to build right areas like New York. It's much more restrictive to build. They treat landlords much worse, right? They have their, their own real estate problems. But if you go look at the migration hubs post COVID and the building patterns there, the, um, availability of homes per sale is absolutely skyrocketing. And a lot of that is those fixed cost insurance uh, pieces. I think something like a third of the houses in America are fully paid off and 95% of the remaining ones on mortgages are still on 30 year fixed mortgages, 2021 vintages and earlier, right? So it's like some people who fully own their home, just the insurance payments alone and those increases and the taxes might actually cause them to have to relocate. I think you're seeing a lot more of that happen now. Um, so. Well, I, I'll, I'll keep watch when I visit Florida next week. And then when I go to Austin and visit Austin, um, I'll go shopping. Use some Bitcoin. So, <laughs> so changing the subject a bit, um, we do have a, a, a question from uh, Eric around AI. Um, he's He asks, what's the best edge? against AI displacing 25% of the white collar workforce? So I think AI, the impact on jobs, I think in many ways is overhyped. Um, to sort of put it in perspective, so in the beginning of the 1900s, something like 80% of the jobs in the U.S. were farm laborers of some sort or another. Right. And then they were replaced by mechanized agriculture. And that was just an absolute jobs Armageddon. Right. So everybody should have been starving to death. Right. It didn't work out. Why didn't it work out? Because it turns out that there is an infinite number of jobs under the surface. Uh, if you think of all the things. So like you personally. OK. Just as a mental experiment. What if you could hire people for one dollar a day? OK. You win a contest on the radio and you can hire an unlimited number of people for one dollar a day. How many people would you employ for $1 a day? I would have a cook. I would have somebody who keeps the dog company while I'm at work. Holy cow, man. I would employ like 20 people. All right. I would find something for them to do. Right. Uh, I don't know. When I, when I tell a joke, I would be like, hey, tell me if this joke is funny. Okay. I could think of a lot of things that I could hire people to do. But I don't hire them because they're too expensive. Okay. Uh, now, what happens with automation is that the automation itself makes us all richer, okay? And so with that, and so we can afford to pay more for these things, right? So like a butler in America makes a lot more than a butler in India, okay? And the reason is because there's automation all around that butler in America, right? If you look at countries that have very low automation, well, here, let's start with somebody who has high automation like Japan. There's a huge labor shortage in Japan, okay? Can't find enough people. Now, go to a country that's very low automation where everybody's doing everything by hand, like Burundi. Like, everybody's sitting around, there's no jobs in Burundi. Why? Because there's no automation. All right, so it's it's counterintuitive, but the automation actually creates more jobs. The way that it does that is by making us richer. All right, so if AI, uh, you know, has a big impact on business, then that is going to create an enormous amount of profit. It's going to raise wages. 
Uh, it's going to mean that a lot of workers are, you know, however productive they are today, tomorrow that worker combined with AI is going to be like three times more productive, right? Which means that they're going to be creating three times more value. And eventually that ends up in wages. I mean, they, you know, there's a very long history of that occurring, right? Uh, GDP has a pretty close correspondence to wages. As we get richer, we then find other things, uh, you know, other needs that, um, because we're so rich, you know, we can hire people now uh, to give us an experience on the weekend instead of just, you know, watching the TV or whatever, right? Uh, cooking classes. I mean, just endless things that, you know, people might laugh at, you know, uh, a yoga instructor who does house calls. I mean, whatever, right? People find all kinds of needs that they have if they're rich enough. So, you know, I think in the long run, uh, people are going to be absolutely fine if AI takes off. Uh, the only risk that I would worry about is if the government gets in the way of job creation, right? That was what happened in Detroit, for example. So the auto industry went away, and uh, the problem is that new jobs didn't show up to replace them, right? Uh, there were new jobs all over the country, right? Like Seattle and Austin and San Francisco and all these places, you know, they didn't have enough housing that, you know, tons of jobs couldn't find people. But all those jobs passed Detroit. Why did they pass Detroit? Because you would have had to be insane to start a business in Detroit, right? You were so harassed by the taxes and the regulations and the poor public services that, you know, ended up making it unsafe and all up and down the line. The electricity goes out. Who knows? Uh, so that would be my biggest concern is that, you know, technological advances um, in historically for millennia, really, uh, they have created more jobs than they've replaced by making us wealthier. The only concern would be in, if the government gets in the way. Now, on a personal level, what can you do? Well, in an AI world, similar to in an industrial world, the more um, human skills you have, the more valuable you are. Okay, so we saw a similar thing with YouTube. Like, if you were pretty funny at the bar, okay, like every time you walked in the bar, everybody was really excited because you always said funny things. Okay, in the 1970s, you didn't make much money doing that, okay? Now you do a YouTube channel, and holy moly, you're worth millions, right? So the point is, take very human things that you do, whatever that is, uh, art, uh, I mean, just something that only humans can do, or something that has value because humans did it, right? AIs can imitate, but something that has value. So, like, you know, you could duplicate this entire discussion right here, uh, using an AI, but the point is that people are listening right now because we're actually humans. The fact that we're humans is bringing value to this. Okay, so any kind of thing like that, where the humanity is the value, that is going to be very highly paid. So marketing, art, uh, creating any kind of um, uh, content, I think those are really the ways that you're going to make money in the future. That's what we have our kids on, right? We, we're, we're not telling them tech. We're not telling them any kind of... Uh, you could argue the trades, actually, because um, that's probably not going to be automated for a while, HVAC and stuff like that. Uh, but beyond that, in terms of intellectual stuff, look for things that humans bring value to and focus on those. Sounds like uh, improv classes with your kids, sounds like. Uh, Bingo. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah. More unfortunately, it sounds like you're telling me that with the rise of AI, there's going to be a continued wave of life coaches. Though. So that I'm less excited about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I was I was talking to the bank the other day, and they asked me what I do, and uh, you know, I was trying not to use the word influencer. I was like, I was like, I make videos. He was like, what kind of videos? And I was like, look, I'm an I'm an influencer. <laughs> it was really kind of embarrassing. I was like, don't tell nobody. But yes, fortunately. You are you are very you are very good. part of the new economy for better or worse. <laughs> I I used to have an honest job, so there you go. I I paid my dues with the real work. Wow. Well, this has been really terrific, Peter. Um as a reminder, where can people find you and learn more about what you do? Uh so I'm over on Twitter. That's pretty much where the party is if you're not on there. Uh Prof Stop Prof Saint Ange. <laughs> Uh, then I also have a website, petersanonage.com. I do weekly articles. Uh, so uh, round up the daily videos and put those on podcasts for all to listen. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. And, and thank uh, you guys for having me on. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. It's been fun. Thank you so much.
All righty. Take care. All right, guys.